guys, welcome to my channel, I'm Gress and this is part 2 of the 39 steps. Uh, I only got through the first 2 chapters in the last video, uh, but I should try and get through at least 3 or 4 in this one. It's an enjoyable game, and uh, let's see what I get up to next. An unlikely visit. On day 18th of May 1914, in Paul Street, London. Quite a lot of chapters to this game from the look of it. And the sounds are good in it as well. Nothing else I need to do? No. Hey! Can I speak to you? May I come in for a minute? I recognized him as the occupant of a flat on the top floor with whom I had passed the time of day on the stairs. He was slim, with a short brown beard and small, glint, gimlety blue eyes. His hand was pouring at my arm. I motioned him in. I do like the gestures that's on it. It's a good idea. It's a bit different. No sooner was he over the threshold than he made a dash for my back room where I used to smoke and write my letters. Then he bolted back. Is the door locked? It must be locked now. filled himself with a stiff whiskey and soda and drank it off in three gulps. I sat down in an armchair and lit my pipe. I was pretty certain that I had to deal with a madman. I'm very sorry. It's a mighty liberty, but you look like the kind of man who would understand. I've had you in my mind all this week when things got troublesome. Say, will you do me a good turn? I'll listen to you. That's all I'll promise. Pardon. I'm a bit rattled tonight. You see, I happen at this moment to be dead. What does it feel like? A smile flickered over his drawn face. I'm not mad. Yet. Say, sir, I've been watching you and I reckon you're a cool customer. I reckon, too, you're an honest man and not afraid of playing a bold hand. I'm gonna confide in you. I need help worse than any man ever needed it. I want to know if I can count you in. Get on with your yarn and I'll tell you. I must say I do like the detailing in this game. 
it's different. Away behind all the governments and armies, there was a big subterranean movement going on, engineered by some very dangerous people. The sort of educated anarchists that make revolutions. And behind them, the financiers who were playing for money. They wanted Russia and Germany at loggerheads. Basically, it's like a war. Everything would be in the melting pot. The anarchists looked to see a new world emerge, while the capitalists would make fortunes by buying up wreckage. And Scudder had himself convinced that Jewish men were behind it all. On the 15th day of June, Constantine Karolides is coming to the city. The British Foreign Office has taken to having international tea parties, and the biggest of them is due on that date. Now, Karolides has reckoned the principal guest, and if my friends have their way, he will never return to his admiring countrymen. I sat up for that, for I had been reading about Karolides that very afternoon. Well, that's simple enough, anyhow. You can warn him and keep him at home. <laughs> and play their game. If he does not come, they win, for he's the only man that can straighten out the tangle. And if his government are warned, he won't come, for he does not know how big the stakes will be on June the 15th. I was beginning to get interested in the beggar. Well, what about the British government? They're not going to let their guests be murdered. Tip them the wink, and they'll take extra precautions. No good. They might stuff your city with plainclothes detectives and double the police. And Constantine would still be a doomed man. He'll be murdered by an Austrian. And there'll be plenty of evidence to show the connivance of the big folk in Vienna and Berlin. It will all be an infernal lie, of course, but the case will look black enough to the world. But it's not going to come off if there's a certain man alive right here in London on the 15th day of June. And that man is going to be your servant, Franklin P. Scudder. Okay. I was getting to like the little chap. His jaw had shut like a rat trap. There was a fire of battle in his gimlet eyes. Where did you find out this story? I completed my evidence ten days ago in Paris. I can't tell you the details now, for it's something of a history. But when I was quite sure in my own mind, I judged it my business to disappear. And I reached this city by a mighty queer circuit. Till yesterday, I thought I had muddied my trail some. And was feeling pretty happy. Then... The recollection seemed to upset him. And he gulped down some more whiskey. Then I saw a man standing in the street outside this block. I used to stay close in my room all day, and only slip out after dark for an hour or two. I watched him for a bit from my window, and I thought I recognized him. He came in and spoke to the porter. When I came back from my walk last night, I found a card in my letterbox. It bore the name of the man I want least to meet on God's earth. I think that the look in my companion's eyes, the sheer naked scare on his face, completed my conviction of his honesty. What did you do next? I realized I was bottled as sure as a pickled herring, <laughs> and that there was only one way out. I had to die. If my pursuers knew I was dead, they would go to sleep again. How did you manage it? Scudder had died. Let's go through the steps. Step one. I told the man who valets me that I was feeling pretty bad and got myself up to look like death. That wasn't difficult, for I'm no slouch in disguises. Right. Step two. Then I got a corpse 
you can always get a body in London if you know where to go for it. I fetched it back in a trunk on the top of the four-wheeler, and I had to be assisted upstairs to my room. This guy's got it pretty much planned out of the sky. I had to pile up evidence for the inquest. So I went to bed and got my man to mix me a sleeping draft, and then I told him to let it out. He wanted to fetch me a doctor, but I swore some and said I couldn't abide leeches. Suckers for leeches. When I was left alone, I started to fake up that corpse. He was my size, and I judged he had perished from too much alcohol, so I put some spirits about the place. The jaw was a weak point in the likeness, so I blew it away with a revolver. I dare say there would be somebody to swear having heard a shot, but there were no neighbours on my floor, and I guessed I could risk it. I step forward in the yard, and step five, the last step. I left the body in bed, dressed up in my pyjamas, with a revolver lying on the bedclothes, and a considerable mess, considerable mess around. Then I got into a suit of clothes I had kept waiting for emergencies. I didn't dare shave for fear of leaving tracks. Besides, it wasn't any kind of use for me trying to get into the streets. So, he basically faked his own murder, using a separate corpse on the bed, and, well, as it shows it on there, that works as a distraction to make it look like he had passed away. I had had you in my mind all day, and there seemed nothing to do but to make an appeal to you. I watched from my window till I saw you come home, and then slipped down the stair to meet you. sat blinking like an owl, fluttering with nerves and desperately determined. There, sir. I guess you know about as much as me of this business. I was now pretty well convinced that he was going straight with me. It was the wildest sort of narrator. But I had heard in my time many steep tales which had turned out to be true. And if he had wanted to get any get a location in my flat and then cut my throat, he would have pitched me a mile the yard. Hand me your key and I'll take a look at the corpse. Excuse my caution, but I'm bound to verify a bit if I can. I reckon you'd ask for that. But I haven't got it. It's on my chain on the dressing table. I had to leave it behind, for I couldn't leave any clues to breed suspicions. The gentry who are after me are pretty bright-eyed citizens. You'll have to take me on trust for the night, and tomorrow you'll get proof of the corpse business right enough. I thought for an instant or two. Right. I'll trust you for the night. I'll lock you into this room and keep the key. Just one word, Mr. Scudder. I believe you're straight, but if so be you are not, I should warn you that I'm a handy man with a gun. I haven't the privilege of your name, sir, but let me tell you that you're a true gentleman. Now I'll thank you to lend me a razor. I took him into my bedroom and turned him loose. In half an hour's time, a figure came out that I scarcely recognised. My hat, Mr. Scudder. New man. Let's look at the similarities. Only his gimletly hungry eyes were the same. Differences. He was the very model, even to the brown complexion, of some British officer who had had a long spell in India. He was shaved clean, his hair was parted in the middle, and he had cut his eyebrows. Not Mr. Scudder. Captain Theopolis Digby of the 40th Gurkhas, presently home on leave. I'll thank you to remember that, sir. He's gone from an American accent to an English accent. I made him up a bed in the smoking room and sought my own couch, more cheerful than I had been for the past month. Things did happen occasionally, 
even in this God-forgotten metropolis. So that's another chapter completed. Let's go into this one, deeper into this mess. Scudder had confided in Hanani, but he is not out of danger. Officially dead, he must now lie low. Well. Okay, let's go for this one, deeper into this mess. Tuesday, 19th of May, 1914, Wimpole Street in London. The grandfather clock ticks away. Stop that row, Paddock. There's a friend of mine, Captain... Captain... Oh, he's dossing down in there. Get breakfast for two, and then come and speak to me. Paddock. That is his butler, I believe, for his servant. He had about as much gift of the gab as a hippopotamus. I was not a great hand at balloting, but I knew I could count on his loyalty. See the acquaintance. Paddock was a fellow I had done a good turn to out on to out on the Selequi, and I had inspanned him as my servant as soon as I got to England. One must make wake up to the bright sunlight for the breakfast table. I told Paddock a fine story about how my friend was a great swell, with his nerves pretty bad from overwork, who won who wanted absolute rest and stillness. Nobody had got to know he was here, or he would be besieged by communications from the India office, and the Prime Minister and his cure would be ruined. And I am bound to say Scudder played up splendidly when he came to breakfast. He fixed Paddock with his eyeglass, just like a British officer, asked him about the Boer War, and slung out at me a lot of stuff about imaginary pals. Paddock couldn't learn to call me Sir, but he served Scudder as if his life depended on it. I left him with a newspaper and a box of cigars, and headed out to Alexandra Park Race Course. When I got back to the lift, man, when I got back, the lift man had an impo important face. My reading and speaking's not working well tonight. Nasty business here this morning, sir. Jet in number 15, being in shot itself. I just took him to the mortuary. The police are up there now. Hmm. Let's go upstairs and have a look. I ascended to number 15 and found a couple of bobbies and an inspector busy making an examination. I asked a few idiotic questions and they soon kicked me out. I attended the inquest the next day. The jury found it was a case of suicide while of unsound mind. I gave Scudder a full account of the affair and it interested him greatly. He said he wished he had, could have attended, for he reckoned it would be about as spicy as to read one's own obituary notice. Scudder was a very peaceful the first two days he stayed with me. He read and smoked a bit, and made a heap of jotings in a notebook, or jottings in a notebook. And every night we had a game of chess, at which he beat me how well. But on the third day, I could see he was beginning to get restless.
He fixed up a list of days and started making remarks against them. He started listening for little noises and was always asking me if Paddock could be trusted. Once or twice he got very peevish and apologised for it. I didn't blame him. I made every allowance for he had taken on a fairly stiff job. Typical England. And then one night he was very solemn. Say, Hanny. What is it? I uh, judge I should let you a bit deeper into this business. I should hate to go out without leaving somebody else to put up a fight. He began to tell me in detail why I had only heard from him vaguely. I did not give him very close attention. The fact is, I was more interested in his own adventures than in its high politics. The plot thickens. So, Carolides. I reckon that Carolides and his affairs were not my business. So a lot that's good as said slipped clean out of my memory. He was very clear that the danger to Carolides would not begin till he had got to London. I would come from the very highest quarters where there would be no fault of suspicion. Right. Julia Chichenye, I guess that is. He mentioned the name of a woman, Julia Chichenye, uh, as having something to do with the danger. She would be the decoy, I gathered, to get Carolides out of the care of his guards. And Blackstone. He talked about Blackstone, and a man that lisped in his speech. He described very particularly somebody that he had never referred to without a shudder. An old man who could hug his eyes like a hawk. I guess him that is a guy who's involved with the whole of corruption. Hmm. He remained solemn for the rest of the evening and spoke a good deal about death. I reckon it's like going to sleep when you're pretty well tired out. Awaken a fine summer day with the scent of hay coming in at the window. I used to thank God for such mornings way back in the bluegrass country. And I guess I'll thank him when I wake up on the other side of Jordan. day he was much more cheerful, and read the life of Stonewall Jackson much of the time, while the rest of London celebrated Empire Day. I went out to dinner with a mining engineer, whom I had seen on business, I had to see business, and came back in time for again a chest report in. Open. I suggest he wasn't talking hot to her, but everything points to Hannah as a killer. So we must have to find a way around it. In the suit. Saturday, 23rd of May, 1914, Wimpole Street in London. The dead body was lying on the floor. Only Hannah had glimpsed his eyes on it. This guy was well and truly dead. The knife was the only right thing about him. The poor staring white face was more than I could bear. I 
staggered to a cupboard, found the brandy, and swallowed several mouthfuls. I had seen men die violently before. Indeed, I had killed a few myself in the Matter Valley Wells. But this cold-blooded indoor business was different. I needed to think. His enemies had found him, and had taken the best way to mix in of his silence. Scudder had been in my rooms for four days, and his enemies must have reckoned that he had confided in me. I would be next to go. It might be that very night, or the next day, or the day after. But my number was up all right. So that's a list of the days that have been crossed off in May up to the 24th. No chance. Supposing I went out and now and called in the police. Or went to bed and let Paddock find the body and call him in the morning. What kind of a story was I to tell about Scudder? The odds were a thousand to one that I would be charged with the murder, and the circumstantial evidence was strong enough to hang me. Pointless endeavour. Few people knew me in England. I had no real pal who could come forward and swear to my character. Perhaps that was what those secret enemies were playing for. They were clever enough for anything, and an English prison was as good a way of getting rid of me till after June the 15th as a knife in my chest. If I told the whole story, and by any miracle was believed, I would be playing their game. Carolides would stay at home, which was what they wanted. An age resolve. I'm an ordinary sort of fellow, not braver than other people. I hate to see a good man downed, and that long knife would not be the end of Scudder if I could play the game in his place. So, does that mean he's going to take over the place of Scudder? Someone must have been searching for something, perhaps for the pocketbook. So, let's search his body. There's nothing there. That's his cigars. The knife had pinned Scudder to the floor. So... Let's have a read the paper. Dear Peter, was it Samuel Johnson who wrote When you are tired of London, you are tired of life? Well, my dear Peter, if so, then I am tired of life, for here I am in London, bored, I, bored and uh, right wit's end. This is hard to read. The city is noisy and dusty, that says, and I can't read that bit. I'm yet to meet a suitable lady to pass my time with, though I have not a fair few unsuitable ones. My bets are paying off on the tracks, however, that my shares in the Rhodesian diamond mines continue to keep me dining in the capital's best restaurants. Despite Paddock's continued insistence that I should dine at home and try his own culinary skills. One can only hope that they are better than his valet skills. Speak soon, dear friend. Ah, honey. So, he has a medal. That's both of them done. I think I have all that I read on now. Oh, this is different. I like this. There was no trace of Scudder's black book. Most likely the enemy had found it, but they had not found it on Scudder's body. I had come to a decision. I must vanish somehow, and keep vanished until the end of the second week in June. I wish to heaven 
he had told me more, and that I had listened more carefully to what he had told me. There was a big risk that, even if I weathered through the dangers, I would not be believed in the end. I must take my chance of that, and hope that something may happen which would confirm my tale in the eyes of the government. anywhere as an ordinary Scotsman. I fixed on Galloway as the best place to be. It was the nearest wild part of Scotland, and from the look of the map it was not overfit with population. Suit, a pair of strong nailed boots, and a flannel shirt with a collar. Into my pockets I stuffed a spare shirt, a cloth cap, some handkerchiefs, and a toothbrush. I took fifty pounds of it in sovereigns in a belt which I had brought back from Rhodesia. to arrive punctually at 7.30 and let himself in with a latch key. But about 20 minutes to 7, as I knew from bitter experience, Milkman turned up with a great clatter of cans and deposited my share outside my door. On him, I stalked all my chances. I staked all my chances. I went into the dark and smoking room where I breakfasted off a whiskey and soda and some biscuits. By this time I was getting on for six o'clock. I put a pipe in my pocket and filled my pouch from the tobacco jar on the table by the fireplace. for you. Wish me well, wherever you are. I 
hung about in the hall waiting for the milkman. I was fairly choking to get out of the doors. The fool had chosen this day of all to be night. So, I'm going to leave it at this for the moment. I'm probably going to do some longer videos of this one to go through it. And it's probably going to take quite a few episodes to go through this, but I really enjoyed it. Um, the storytelling side of it works really well. The design of the game is really impressive. The um, gestures, using the mouse to actually open stuff and control stuff, works really well. Uh, in general, it's just an enjoyable game to play. And definitely worth getting on Steam if you like that sort of storytelling game that kind of drags you in uh, with an intriguing story. And it's based on an old book. Which is a good book that's worth reading at some point if you and you really enjoy decent books. Um, but yeah, I'm really enjoying this and I can't wait to do the next video for it. But thanks for watching and I will see you uh, on the next one which will be very soon, hopefully. Okay. See you again soon.